Chapter 10. Five Years Ago It was a beautiful summer day, and Donning Castle's courtyard was in full tournament regalia. Banners fluttered in the gentle breeze. Streamers of every color decorated the stands, the walls, and the castle itself. Along one side of the courtyard, pavilions had been set up for each champion and his retainers. The two largest, of course, belonging to the Donnings and the Braddocks. Nearly everyone in the barony was in attendance. The villains and serfs crowded into an area with no seats, bodies pressed against each other in a roiling mass of sweat and flesh. The nobility were seated comfortably above the rabble on an adjacent side that abutted both the champions' pavilions as well as the area cordoned off for the peasants. A general air of excitement pervaded everything. This annual event was hosted alternately between the Donnings and the Braddocks. It was a large affair, big enough that many of the participating knights had traveled great distances to be here. But despite the fresh faces and thrilling competition, the real excitement each year stemmed from the intense rivalry between the two families. The Donning men were invariably pitted against the Braddock men, and the competition was fierce. Normally, Leah did not particularly care for the violence of the tournaments. While these so-called tournaments of sport were generally fairly mild, they occasionally devolved into bloody spectacles that the crowds loved, but she abhorred. Today, however, she had a special interest in arriving early and sitting close to the yard. Today was William's first tournament. There was an unmistakable air of excitement to it, and Leah was nervous and excited for him all at once. Milady said a familiar voice. She turned to find William standing next to her in his beautiful white armor with blue and gold embroidery. Leah had never seen anything quite like it. She thought it very striking and William particularly handsome in it. I hope this day finds you well, he said with a slight bow. He could not suppress his grin. It does indeed, she replied, smiling back at him. And how is your arm today? The competition is said to be fierce. "'Fear not, milady,' he said with mock humility. "'I am spared the anxiety of the heated battle, "'as I have not yet had the honor of being knighted. "'Therefore I am good for nothing but an exhibition "'before the real entertainment commences.' "'Leah leaned over the rail until her mouth was close to his ear. "'I await your match with earnestness. "'I have no doubt you will be victorious.' "'The lady does me too much honor,' William said, "'bowing again to try to hide his pleasure at her compliment.' When you are finished fawning over the Lady Donning, clear the list to make room for the real knights. William and Leah turned to see Vincent, the youngest son of the Braddock clan, approaching in his new suit of armor. Vincent was Leah's age and a couple of years older than William. He had been knighted specifically to participate in this tournament, and his armor was still a bit large for his frame. Terribly sorry, Vincent, William said, still looking at Leah. I did not see you hiding there in your father's armor. Leah dropped her head to hide her smile. "'This armor was made for me by the finest armorer in all of England,' Vincent retorted. "'The finest armorer he may be, but he needs a new ruler.' "'At least I do not look like a peacock!' Vincent shot back, making reference to William's unusual armor. William had five older brothers who had been teasing him about his choice of armor and weapons for as long as he could remember. Vincent's remark did not faze him. Ah, but how much better to be a peacock that knows he is a peacock than a lamb that thinks himself a lion, William replied. Vincent's face reddened. He was keenly aware that William was getting the better of him in front of Leah. What would you know about it? You are not even close to becoming a knight. You cannot possibly understand the importance of a good suit of armor. I should hope it is not to make one look noble, as the greatest armor in England was clearly unable to manage that on your person, William said. Leah stood by, pretending not to hear any of this exchange, but no matter how hard she tried, she was unable to completely cover up her reactions. She did not care for Vincent Braddock or his oft-repeated and overly pompous overtures toward her. She had to admit, however, that Vincent was handsome. His thin, refined face, delicate nose, and brown hair that swept back from his forehead was definitely pleasing to the eye. But his presumption that she would be so flattered by his advances that she would swoon at his approach irritated her to no end. Turning from William, Vincent addressed Leah. Milady, I trust you will be selected the queen of honor and love for this tournament, for there is certainly no one more fair than you in all of England. I assure you, milady, if I have the fortune of selecting the queen, there is no other before you. It was William's turn to color with jealousy. 
"'You do me too much honor, Sir Knight,' Leo replied demurely. "'But surely your affections and your gallant eye "'would more suitably and more deservedly "'fall upon one of the many beauties in attendance "'rather than one such as myself.' "'Nonsense!' Vincent's resolve only seemed to be strengthened by her protest. "'I will place the Queen's crown on you "'in anticipation of being rewarded with your fair kiss when the day is won.' "'That is perfect,' William said caustically. "'The only thing stopping you from carrying out that promise "'is your lack of skill in your cowardly heart.' "'Sex and dog!' Vincent turned and shoved William to the ground. "'I will kill you for insulting my honor. "'He yanked his sword from its sheath and leveled it at William.' Leah leapt up in alarm. Sir Knight, you would attack an unarmed man? He should have armed himself before insulting my honor, Vincent said darkly. He did not lower his sword. How can one be insulted about something one does not possess, William asked. Vincent roared and started forward. William rolled backward and jumped to his feet. Sir Vincent, if this is truly a matter of honor, Leah said, thinking quickly, should it not be settled in noble combat on the lists? "'What is the meaning of this?' Jean de Wycliffe, a marshal of the field, demanded as he approached the boys. "'Fighting outside the sanctioned event is grounds for ejection from the tournament.' Vincent sheepishly sheathed his weapon. "'I have insulted his honor,' William said boldly. "'Sir Vincent was just challenging me to a duel. Is that not so?' Wycliffe looked between them. "'He is not a member of the chivalry,' he said to Vincent." Such a challenge is not appropriate for a tournament and cannot be held in conjunction with the other battles. There were two marshals of the field that oversaw these annual tournaments. One of the two was chosen by the Donnings and the other by the Braddocks. Jean de Wycliffe was closely associated with the Braddocks family and had been for as many years as the aging but still powerful Martin de Boitier had been with the Donnings. Vincent nodded. Very well. We will match now as part of the exhibition. My honor is more important than some silly tournament, he declared heartily to Jean's skeptical look. You know he is not a knight. He has nothing to lose, Jean said confidentially to Vincent. You, on the other hand, have everything to lose in your first tournament with your father looking on. This is not worth the risk. My honor is not worth the risk of defeat, Vincent glowered. Then what is it worth? I am not some silly child playing at being a knight. I have been insulted, and I demand redress for these offenses. Jean looked at Martin de Boitier, who had just found his way over to them. The other marshal only shrugged. Very well, Jean said, stepping back. Prepare yourselves, gentlemen, as you are up first. I will announce you. The marshals returned to their posts on opposite sides of the yard. Now, Donning, Vincent said with a malicious grin, you are about to feel firsthand what it means to be a real knight. I already know what it's like to have a parent that is at a loss for a birthday gift. Perhaps I, too, will ask for a knighthood for my next birthday. Keep laughing, Saxon. Laugh while I run my Norman lance through your Saxon heart. William's jaw tightened. It had never bothered him that his mother was a Saxon. However, it chafed him now because Vincent intended it as a vile insult, and there was no answer he could make because it was true. How much more the insult, then, when you not only lose your honor to a simple, unknighted nobody, but to a lowly Saxon? Will there be anywhere you can travel in all of England that you will not be laughed at for more than your oversized armor? Vincent looked as though he would take another swing at William. Instead, he turned and stalked away, pausing just long enough to make a curt bow to Leah. Leah, who had watched this whole ordeal unfold, called to William as soon as Vincent was out of earshot. "'William, please do not do this,' she said. "'I have a sense of foreboding about it.' William smiled at her. "'Why concern yourself, my lady? This is the hero of Donning Court you are talking to.' "'William, please, no jokes. "'I cannot tell why, but please make an excuse. "'Apologize to Vincent. Anything.' "'I find your confidence in me very moving,' he said. "'But I can beat this fool. "'These silly games the knights play are dependent upon everyone playing by the same rules. "'Otherwise they are easily put down. "'I will put Vincent down.' "'William, what are you trying to prove?' she asked urgently. "'You berate the chivalry for their vain pride and stupidity, "'and yet here you are being led by the same impulses.' "'William remained unmoved. "'In desperation she tried the next thing that came to her mind "'and immediately wished she had not. "'He is a knight!' she said. 
William's jaw tightened and his eyes narrowed at the insinuation. He started this, not me, he said stiffly. Win or lose, do you think my affections will change? Will I be less inclined to a man who holds my affections because he beat or was beaten by another? Is that important to me? He started this, and I will finish it. William turned to go, but Leah pursued him, stepping over the other spectators as she followed him on the opposite side of the railing that separated the stands from the field. "'William, will you tilt with him when you know nothing of such things?' Her pleas were taking on an air of frustrated anger at his obstinance. "'You have a great many talents, and I have no doubt that you could best him in hand-to-hand combat, but you know nothing of such sports as this.' William did not slow his pace or give any indication he had heard her at all. "'William, people get killed for such trivialities as this,' she said desperately. He whirled to face her. "'There is only one thing I was bred for. "'There is only one thing that I have been trained to do, "'and this fool has chosen this thing in which to test me. "'If there is blood spilled today, it will be Braddock blood!' "'He roared the last at her with a murderous look in his eye and stormed off. "'What is happening?' she demanded of herself. "'How could what had been a perfectly pleasant day only moments before "'spiral out of control so quickly?' She wanted to run after William, to make him see, but there was no point. Men in the stupid vanity. All she could do was wait and pray for the best. She returned to her seat, but fidgeted and squirmed with a presentiment of evil that she could not shake. William and Vincent faced each other across the lists. William was on a borrowed destrier that would not hold still. It sensed the excitement of the crowd and the tension of its rider and stamped nervously this direction and that. William glanced over at Vincent to see if he were experiencing the same awkwardness. Vincent looked every bit the noble knight in his new jousting armor with its reinforced oversized left shoulder plate. His shield had a lion's head emblazoned on it crossed by two swords. The motto, Lionhearted, was engraved beneath it in childish emulation of England's late great King Richard, Coeur du Lion. William smiled to recall his unwitting insult of this earlier when he had compared Vincent to a lamb that thought himself a lion. For all his jabs at Vincent's skills, Vincent was bigger than William, and he was from a strong family. William was not at all sure of himself, and to be humiliated by him in front of Leah was more than he could bear. He had been unable to resist taunting him. He hated that Vincent had such obvious designs on Leah, and he was even more uneasy about the fact that Vincent was very close to the age where he could make a suit for her hand. William was nervous. He knew what he planned to do, but he had scarcely trained in the knight's arts of chivalry. Juro's instructions had been far more pragmatic and devoted little time to silly games, as Juro called them. I teach you to stay alive, not to win silly contests, he would say whenever William asked about it. Nevertheless, as a consequence of his training, William could see a hundred weaknesses in the attack Vincent was guaranteed to employ on this occasion. There was no cunning or strategy involved. It was simply a test of who could take a hit better, and William had no intention of taking a hit from Vincent. In fact, he would unseat Vincent so dramatically that no onlooker would have any choice but to acknowledge the folly of such foolish games as any real test of prowess. His mind was made up, but even as he contemplated his course of action, his resolve wavered. William knew his actions would be frowned upon. And what do you care for the approval of these people who have so long made you the object of their scorn? You have been trained for one thing and one thing only— to win. Juro did not waste time with pretended nobility or vanity. He trained to keep you alive, and that is exactly what you are about to do. Keep yourself alive. You can see how easy it will be to crush this dolt who has challenged you and who sets his lustful eyes on Leah. Why, then, do you hesitate? Juro's words echoed in his ears. The time for fair play is before the battle has begun. If you should not be at odds with an opponent, you halt the situation before it deteriorates to combat. For once the battle is joined, there is only the living and the dead. Yet even as William recalled Juro's instructions, something else was eating at him. Anger is not your ally, Juro had said a thousand times to William, who had come to him as an angry young man. 
Anger robs you of your strength prematurely. It puts blinders on you so all you see is what is in front of you, not what is around you. And it steals your most important weapon, he said, poking William in the forehead. Your mind. Great warriors are not emotional warriors, but calculating, detached intellectuals. This is the most important lesson for you. Although Juro had said this was his most important lesson, it had also proved to be the hardest of all Juro's lessons, one with which William continued to struggle. When he remained in control of his emotions, he was amazed by the almost transcendent power he seemed to have over the battle. But he loved the cathartic release of focusing his anger on a single target and destroying it. It was how he had always dealt with his emotions and the only way he really knew to release them. Juro's method taught him to not let himself get worked up, but that was easy for one as naturally calm as Juro. For William, it was a daily fight. Sitting in the saddle facing Vincent, William knew that anger was controlling him now, but he didn't care. He wanted this. The pleasure of the kill was so much richer in the moment when he surrendered to the rage that fueled him. William's eyes fell on Leah, who was watching anxiously from the stands. He made a mental note to apologize to her when this was all over. Leah was exceedingly soft-hearted, and he worried that he often injured her with his coarse manners. She was only concerned for his well-being, and she was perhaps the only person who cared about that at this point. William looked around at the other spectators. He could feel every eye on him. With a flourish, he tore the cumbersome mismatched helmet, the one the marshals insisted he wear, from his head. A well-placed lance to an unprotected head would be the end of any that were so met, but William had been trained to use every sense, and he could not tolerate the restricted visibility and hearing that the helmet brought with it. The added protection was not worth the sacrifice. Besides, he had no intention of being there when Vincent's lance crossed his path. "'What are you waiting for, you dog?' he muttered under his breath as Vincent continued to watch him without moving. As if Vincent could hear him, he dropped his visor and spurred his horse into a charge. William did likewise. Those assembled drew a collective breath. Though they were only boys, it was to the inexperience that the most grievous injuries were often dealt, the victor not being able to judge the force of his strikes and the loser not being able to absorb them safely. This was even more the interesting battle as it symbolized the next generation of Braddock and Donning families crossing swords in bitter rivalry. This was a joust that no one would soon forget. The two young nobles galloped across the meadow, their horses' hooves churning up the earth with each thundering step. A hush fell over the crowd and they leaned forward in anticipation. Both youths were untried and William was completely exposed. The likelihood of blood being spilt in this joust was high. They waited, some nervous, some excited, but all intent on the field. It was at that moment that everyone saw the function of the outlandish design of William's armor. When the two combatants were only a few paces from each other and their collision was imminent, William rolled out of his saddle and onto the soft turf. The move held a fluidity and grace that was inconceivable in the bulky iron suits his contemporaries wore. He came to his feet with his spear in hand. Vincent charged past William's now riderless steed before his confusion turned to horror as he understood what was about to happen. William swung his spear at Vincent's mount's forelegs as if he were swinging an axe at the trunk of a tree. Vincent dropped his lance and desperately yanked on his horse's reins, but it was too late. With a piercing whinny, the animal pitched forward, catapulting the young knight face first into the dirt. Vincent hit the ground hard. His back arched unnaturally until his mailed boots almost touched the back of his head. There was a terrible crash of armor followed by a profound silence broken only by the horse's pained cries. Astonishment struck the assembly dumb. No one had ever witnessed anything like this. Vincent struggled to his hands and knees and crawled forward in a daze. William stepped up to him with disdain and put his foot on the mailed side of the severely injured man. You lose, Sir Knight, he said, his words dripping with contempt. He shoved Vincent into the dirt. As if this were the signal, the shock of the moment wore off the crowd. As one, they rose to their feet, howling their displeasure. The marshals spurred their horses forward and raced out to the competitors. Surrender your weapon, Jean ordered William while Martin tended to Vincent. William looked at Jean in mild surprise. Since when is it custom to demand the weapon of the victor? How 
dare you claim victory for such an unchivalrous, unbecoming... The marshal's words failed him as he sputtered in rage. How dare you speak in such a way? Shame, William Dawning. Shame. Now surrender your weapon. Jean took a menacing step forward and William thrust his spear forward, letting it slide through his grip until the point was only a few inches from the marshal's throat before tightening his hand and halting his progress. The marshal froze, looking at the point of the weapon that was uncomfortably close to his unprotected neck. I take such actions as this to be threatening, and I will only surrender my weapon when it has been struck from me. Do you believe that you are the warrior to do that? His spear was steady and his gaze hard. I await your decision, Sir Knight, William said to the aging marshal, his voice carrying the same derision he had used with Vincent. Jean said nothing. His only answer was to look down at Vincent, who, by now, had his helmet removed to reveal his crushed face. Vincent's nose was broken, his jaw twisted, and there were lacerations running across all visible parts of his skin. His eyes had rolled back in his head, and there was such an effusion of blood that William's resolve wavered slightly as he looked upon the damage he had inflicted. The marshal looked for help from his comrade, but Martin was already racing toward the stands, yelling for help. Feeling helpless, Jean only repeated with all the force of passion he could muster, "'Your coat of arms shall be reversed and subject to derision for your misdeeds. You shall be known as an unchivalrous coward. How dare you! How dare you! Oh, shame! Shame, William Dawning!' At the sight of Vincent's condition, William began to feel the moment of the marshal's words. But the hissing, booing crowd strengthened his resolve to behave as if this were what he had intended all along. Baron Braddock and his entourage were running to Vincent's aid. William decided this was a timely moment for his departure. Wordlessly, he whirled his spear back under his shoulder and stood upright from his guard position. Do as you like. I am not a knight, and your threats are meaningless to me. William mounted his horse, trying not to show that he was in a hurry, though he feared that any moment he would be seized from behind. He turned his mount and began to leave the field. In order to reach the gates, he had to pass the gallery of the nobles where his mother was seated with Leah and Vincent Braddock's family. As he passed them, each of the nobles turned their back on him, disavowing any connection with him. Taking their cue from the nobles, everyone in the general crowd followed suit. The jeering stopped and the field fell silent, save for the exertions of those laboring to assist Vincent. Of those in the stands, only Martha and Leah had not turned their backs on him, but his mother had her eyes fixed on the ground. Leah's eyes were wide and full of emotion as she watched him. William stopped and looked at her for a long moment. Her expression was one of concern mixed with disappointment. It was in her fervent gaze that William found the shame he had refused to feel up to that point. She looked as if she would go to him, but remained where she was. William desperately wanted to flee from the courtyard and remove himself from the palpable scorn of those assembled, but to do so would have been a sign of weakness, an admission of guilt, and in his eyes he had done nothing wrong. His only offense was to prove himself superior to the chivalry and their silly traditions. There was extra commotion around Vincent that caught William's attention. He turned and locked eyes with Daniel Braddock, who was cradling the limp body of his son. The huge baron set his son down gently and then stood and roared across the list to William. I will avenge this injury to my family upon you, William Donning. From this day, you and I are enemies, and I consider any who aid you as an enemy to the Braddocks. I swear to drink your blood, William Donning. William did not respond. He was terrified that not only had he turned the whole of Donning Court against him in a single instant, but that Daniel Braddock, who had known him since birth, had just sworn a blood feud against him. Baron Braddock took his silence as disdain and only grew angrier. I would challenge your honor if you had any honor to challenge. You are a fool and a coward. William forced himself to maintain an even pace. He knew the epithets that Daniel Braddock was hurling at him now were intended to goad him into a duel but he was terrified of the wrath of this seasoned warrior. Still, William's pride was his defense. It would not permit him to appear to be afraid or seem to be running away. He snorted at Braddock and withdrew, praying that they were not, even then, riding after him. William felt the injustice of the day very acutely. 
He had been wronged, and it was he who had been challenged. Yet when he chose to defend himself in the way he knew best, he was scorned and despised. He rode in solitude through the forest for some time before finding himself at the lodging of the one person who should understand his actions. He walked into the small training building in which he had spent so many years. The floor was made of tatami, a traditional Asian straw that was tightly woven into mats that were softer than wood or dirt, but still strong enough to withstand the abuse they were subjected to as a natural part of physical training. The interior walls, of which there were few, were made of elaborately decorated paper. William had always taken pride in the fact that he was learning weapons and skills that his brothers would never know, but it was only today that he began to realize how divergent his education was from his brothers. He was totally unprepared to participate in their shows of gallantry and chivalry, and obviously they were as equally unprepared to withstand him. He walked through the main room, its exterior walls covered with racks of weapons of every description, and entered a small single-room antechamber that Juro had made his home for all the time William had known him. There were few decorations, and even fewer mementos of Juro's past. His history had always been something of a mystery to William, and he spoke little of it. On a few occasions, Juro indicated that he had left his homeland as a result of oppression. William had gathered that his exodus was an extremely bloody affair, but Juro had never volunteered more, and William had never felt it appropriate to pry into something that his instructor clearly did not want to speak about. Along with the decorations, the furnishings were also sparse. A thin mat on the floor showed where Juro spent his nights, and a small tokatsu, a short table with a small brazier set in the middle for warming the room and heating a small tea kettle, sat in the middle of the room. Juro had always lived this way, neither asking for luxuries nor accepting them when offered. He seemed content in his surroundings, but his motives for staying on at Donning Court after William's father had died had always been inscrutable to William. Drew kept little society with the locals and trained few apart from William, and even then the training was only casual, satisfying the curiosity of the youth more than anything. William tapped on the wood frame of the thin paper door. Shitsure shimas, he said to announce his presence, and slid back the panel. Juro was inside, loading his scant belongings into a trunk. What is this? William demanded. You are leaving? You leave me little choice, William. Juro said in his proficient but accented English. "'I leave you little choice?' William asked. He was already sensing that he would find no comfort for his recent deeds here. "'What does that mean?' Juro continued packing without a word. "'Is this about today? About the tournament? That has nothing to do with you. I acted of my own free will, and I would do it again.' "'You have disgraced me, William!' Juro barked, standing upright. "'Disgraced you?' I did exactly what you taught me. You taught me to fight to win. I do not understand the ridiculous games. Because of your training, all I can see is the many weaknesses they throw open to those who do not obey their silly rules. Vincent challenged me. Vincent lost. You were participating in their games. Therefore, you were obliged to obey their rules. If you were unwilling to do that, you should never have agreed to it. Dro resumed loading his belongings. He insulted me in front of Leah, and then he challenged me, William protested. You allowed him that control over you. You allowed yourself to be put into a situation where your foolish pride dictated your actions. Not your sense, not your brain, but your pride. Yes, you beat him. And where is your pride now? Is this a victory in your heart? Dro said all this without looking up from his preparations. I thought you would understand, William said, visibly deflated. I thought you would... He trailed off, unwilling to open himself up to another scathing rebuke. That I would what? Approve? Juro paused for a moment to face his pupil in the yellow light of the small room. Then you have understood nothing of what I have tried to teach you. Of all the people I have trained, you were my best, my brightest pupil. To do yourself honor was to do me honor, but you have disgraced yourself and disgraced me. You do not have to leave. I have no choice. I made you what you are. I took a child haunted with demons and thought to tame those demons, to make him a man. Instead, I have made a remorseless weapon that cannot tell the difference between right and wrong. How can I live under the good graces of those who trusted your development to me when this is the result? His words stung William like no one else's could have. 
He felt the disappointment he had seen on his mother's face in Juro's words. My ways are strange to your people, but your father and mother gave me a sacred trust, a trust in which I have failed. That was never so plain as it was today, and some day those demons are going to get loose again, and then woe be unto all who are in your way. You want me to apologize to that buffoon? William demanded. Very well. I will do that now. I will degrade myself in front of everyone and beg the forgiveness of a lesser man for besting him in his own contest. Will that satisfy your honor? William spat the last word in disgust. Jero stopped suddenly and looked at him. William, Vincent is dead. How do you apologize for that? He had raised his voice, something he only did on occasions when he felt he was not getting through to his pupil. How do you undo that? Shame, William. For shame, he unknowingly repeated the reproach of the marshal of the field. William leaned against the frame of the door, stunned. I do not understand what I did wrong, William protested in a weak voice. His whole world was collapsing around him. And that is the problem, Juro finished simply. Neither of them spoke for a long moment while Juro stared at the floor, ruminating. At last he sighed and placed both hands on William's shoulders. "'You are the most talented pupil I have ever trained,' he said. "'But your fear and anger have robbed you of your humanity. "'I thought I could quell that in you. "'I believed that with patience and care I could channel that, but I have failed. "'You felt the power of emotionally distancing yourself while in the training yard. "'Yet as soon as it mattered, you let your anger rule you.' He sighed again. <sighs> Had I at least instilled in you your country's rules of chivalry, valor, and honor, you would have had some guidelines by which to govern your behavior. But I have robbed you of that. Is there no hope for me, then? Am I so lost that even my mentor will not abide with me? William's voice cracked with emotion. There are noble and good things in you, William, but like a once-hewn lawn that is now overgrown with weeds— the fruits of fear, anger, and hatred have cast a shadow over them until they are all but hidden. These are the demons that rest upon your shoulders, and until you cast them off, they are in control. Now, he said, straightening, I must beg redress for my failings at your mother's hands. He walked around William to leave his chamber. Will you not stay? Will you not help me? William pleaded, unable to look at him. I have no one else. Juro paused when they were shoulder to shoulder. He also did not look at his ward, as he did not want William to see the emotion in his own eyes. My stain would avail you little, as you will no longer be at Donning Court. William looked at him sharply, wondering what worse fate was yet in store for him. Braddock's last son is dead because of your actions. If you wish to survive the night, you will not be here when the sun sets. What? William suddenly felt fear grip him. Words failed him. There is a contingent of soldiers passing by Donning Court this evening, on their way for the Holy Land. You best be with them. And William, Juro said meaningfully, not a word to anyone. Your very life depends on your anonymity in this. Juro made as if to leave and then stopped one last time. May God watch over you, my son, he said, still not looking at his erstwhile pupil, and left the room. William remained in stunned silence, unable to comprehend how quickly his life had been destroyed. It was as if all his past misdeeds that had gone unpunished were catching up to him at this moment, and all the injury he had done was being returned upon his own head. He remained in this attitude for a time, until all at once he raced from Juro's room. There was little time before sunset, and much to be done. The moon was high when Leah rode up the path that ran along the stream into the woods. It was too dangerous for a lone female to enter the woods after dark, but if she were right, that would not be necessary. She crested the small hill and looked over the moonlit clearing, where she had spent so many carefree hours with William. If he had intended to see her, this is where he would be. And oh, how she needed him to be here. She needed to know that he spared a thought for her as their lives were being suddenly and dramatically torn apart. 
Not far from the woods, there was a gnarled old willow tree that they had shaded under on a thousand warm afternoons, and that is where she directed her mare. Though the moon was high, the shadows it cast made this old familiar place seem very foreign. The sounds all around her seemed unnatural, and more than once she nearly lost her nerve and turned back. But of all nights, this was not the night to be frightened of shadows. There was too much at stake. She rode up to the large willow trunk and reined in sharply. A figure was before her, spear dramatically whirling overhead. It was only after she identified herself that William relaxed. He stood from the tense crowd she was in. I was wondering if you would come, he said with relief plain in his voice. She slid out of the saddle and followed him around the willow tree where they were hidden from view of anyone not coming from the forest itself. I had to come, she said in an earnest whisper. She was not sure why she was whispering, but it seemed appropriate. And I had to see you. William, she started anxiously, but could not say what was in her heart. He looked up expectantly from where he had dropped to the dirt and slumped against the trunk of the tree, but she only lowered her eyes. I am sorry about all this. He snorted and shook his head. It is very strange to think that I have forever altered the course of my life in a single day. Everything I have ever wanted, that I ever thought I would be, has just changed. I have changed it forever, he grudgingly admitted. It doesn't have to be that way, she protested. We can fix this. We can talk to Baron Braddock. We... It cannot be fixed, William cut her off heatedly. His son is dead. He is not going to forget that. He is not going to forgive me because I say I am sorry. Vincent is dead and nothing will change that. William sighed and shook his head. Perhaps I should go to Braddock anyway. Let him have me. Leah looked confused. But if he will not forgive you, why would you... Do you not see, Leah? Everything is different now because of this. My mother will protect me, and we will go to war with the Braddocks over this. Instead of one life being lost, hundreds will be slaughtered, and my family could lose everything. Because of me, his voice cracked at this last statement. William, no, she gasped. He smiled at her reaction. Do not be concerned, Leah. Whether by fear, pride, or something else, I cannot conceive of myself submitting to my doom over this. He dropped his head back against the rough bark of the tree. I suppose there was nowhere else my road could lead. He chuckled a mirthless sound. It seems so obvious now. It is a wonder I never considered it before, yet somehow I never saw myself as the villain before today. I always believed that I was the hero, and that everything would work out because deep down, I never really meant any harm. What a naive fool I was. M. He shook his head in disgust. But, he said hesitantly, looking at the ground as he spoke, you tried to warn me. Had I listened to you, none of this would be happening. He trailed off and the silence remained until Leah finally spoke. What will you do? William shrugged. I will leave. If I run, I will be branded an honorless coward. But it would avail Braddock little to exact revenge on my family, as it will not get him what he wants. If only my father were still alive, Braddock would not even consider going against the Dawnings. Yet my father is the reason that I know there is no forgiveness to be had. He would not let this stand, and Braddock is cut from the same cloth. He chuckled the same mirthless laugh as before and shook his head again. Leah knelt beside him, took his hand in both of hers and pulled it close to her. You will always have a friend here, William. William sat up close to her. Leah... Will you make me a promise? was almost a plea. Something that I have no right to ask but must anyway. Her eyes widened slightly and her pulse quickened. Anything, she said breathlessly. Will you promise me that you will always remember that I meant no harm? That at this moment you knew there were true and noble things in my heart? Oh, Leah's countenance fell. Of course. Even should Braddock sweep down in his wrath and those you love are killed and your family is forced to flee, will you remember that? Will you recall my sincere regret and that I tried to do what was necessary to put it right, even giving up everything? He was looking deeply into her eyes, earnestly seeking for confirmation that she understood his true meaning. Leah took a deep breath to regain control of her emotions and to hide the sharp pangs of disappointment in her heart. Of course, William. 
I have always known that about you, and this has not diminished my esteem for you. I would give anything to undo it, but what is done is done. William jumped to his feet again. I must be on my way. It will not be long before Braddock discovers I have fled, and he will pursue me. She rose beside him. I would that I had listened to you, my good angel. It was only after it was over that I could see so clearly that is what you are to me. If I but had the wisdom to recognize it before, how much happier would I be now? And I, William, she said softly. He stared at her a moment longer as if trying to burn her image into his brain. I must not delay any longer. He started for the trees to retrieve his horse, but had only gone a few paces before he again came to a stop with his back to her. He did not move for a long moment. William, Leah took a step forward. Are you well? Without a word, he dropped his spear, spun, and crossed the distance to her with a few long strides. He reached for her and pulled her to him in a desperate embrace. His lips found her ready to receive him, and at last they shared the kiss that each of them had dreamed about for years, a gesture that did more to express their feelings for each other than words ever could. Warmth flooded over her body and carried Leo away, and only for an instant she forgot that she was only moments away from losing him. For just that instant she was with the man she loved, receiving in return the feelings that she had always hoped he cherished for her. As that one sublime moment passed, their passion gave way to tears. William held his dearest friend close to him for a long time while she wept silently. If there were one thing I could change, one thing I could undo, he trailed off, not bothering to articulate what Leah could feel so clearly. She held on to him and wished there was some other alternative. Where will you go? she asked when he finally stepped back. I will join the Crusades. They can always use a good spear there. He wiped her tear-stained cheeks and brushed his own away. I must go. She nodded and reluctantly broke contact with him. He disappeared into the forest and emerged a few moments later, leading his heavily laden mount by the bridle. William, Leah started and again stopped herself when she met his eyes. Please be careful, she said simply. Leah, I do not know what to say. He was fiddling idly with the ties he used to secure his weapon to his mount. Thank you. Thank you for everything you are and have always been to me. With that, he climbed into the saddle, and taking one last lingering look at her, he spurred his horse into a gallop. Leah watched him ride away into the darkness. As he reached the crest of the hill, he stopped once more and looked back for a long time before disappearing into the black mass of the landscape. You have been listening to Selections from the Night's Dawning by James Batchelor. If you have enjoyed this program, you may continue the adventure by downloading the complete audiobook from audible.com or Apple's iBooks. Links are included in the description beneath the video. Please like and subscribe to be notified of future content from James Batchelor. You may also visit PendantBooks.com for more information. Thank you for listening.